So uh, <clears throat> when Andreas put up the, the slide showing the four of us, I realized embarrassingly that I'm wearing the same shirt. <laughs> <laughs> so clearly I'm going to have to either change the picture or stop wearing this shirt when I give a talk. I'm not wearing the coat, so that, that comes for something. Um, so this is called a boot camp. This is actually the first time that I've been to a, 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 been to a boot camp. And uh, at least in the United States, the boot camp has sort of a, a connotation <laughs> that I'm not really sure that we want exactly. So. Hope, hopefully what we mean is, is time to get together and, and think about these issues, and perhaps not uh, with the four of us as, as your drill sergeants. Um, Andreas, I think, rightly pointed out that a lot of research on games and play and many other things work something like this. There's something that you do, some sort of assessment, and you do the thing that you're supposed to do, the intervention, and there's something else that you do at the end. And the way in which we understand the game is by looking at the difference between the two something else's. Um, which, is, which in a sense, just as Andreas was suggesting, makes the game, almost the properties of the game are almost irrelevant, except to the extent that you perhaps have two different versions of the game that you compare between the something else's. Um, personally, I'm actually more interested in, though, I mean, I care about the, the overall impacts. But what I care about is the mechanisms by which those impacts take place. What's going on in the game, in the situation, that are causing these changes? And also, of course, what things are happening within the game that cause other things in the game to, to matter. So uh, my interest is in being able to zoom in on the experience that, that, uh, that students are having. So the way to, the, in order to do that, we have to... Uh, start with kind of an important premise, I think, about learning, which is that ultimately all learning is actually about enculturation. Um, let me just give you a quick example of what I mean by that in the, in the game space, and then I'll un unpack it a little bit. Uh, so this is one of my kids' favorite games. It's called Webkins. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, it's a very American game. You buy a plush toy, and then that animal appears in the, uh, in the game for a year. And then if you want to keep playing, you have to buy another toy. Um, and so you can interact with your pet in the, with your, with, with your uh, pet in the world. You can ask the pet questions. Uh, how are you feeling? How are you doing? You can get sort of answers that teach you about the way that the world works. So for example, your pet can say, I had, just had a big party. Um, the main mechanism of the game, again, this being American, is that you can buy stuff uh, for your pet. Uh, in order to buy stuff, therefore, they have their own currency. It's the uh, uh, Webkin's currency, Webcash or something. Um, so you have to be able to earn Webcash. So you can do things like, well, you can gamble. Uh, that's one way to earn money. Um, <laughs> you, can, uh, you can play educational games. This one's called Booger Gets an A. Um, the, uh, yeah, I, I don't really know who came up with that name, Booger, in, in American English. It's not really, anyway. Uh, so here you have to figure out what smaller numbers add up to a larger number, um, and when you get it right, you get kind of the usual uh, pro-social messages about math. Um, you can, I kid you not, go to work in the mines. Um, and then there's a host of other 21st century occupations that you can do, uh, deliver newspapers, work in a shoe store, be somebody's personal assistant, paint fences. Right? Um, in other words, <laughs> what we mean by learning is about enculturation, borrowing from Jim G, is that what it means to learn something is to acquire a discourse, a socially accepted association among ways of using language, thinking, feeling, believing, valuing, acting, that can be used to identify oneself as a member of a socially meaningful group, or to signal that one is playing a socially meaningful role, to participate in some way in society, to solve problems the way people solve problems, to become part of some community of practice. In other words, if learning is about enculturation, a culture is actually, to become part of a culture means to acquire a discourse. Um, let me kind of give you a, another a quick, more real world example of this. Right? So uh, this is a picture of dirt. When I look at this picture, I imagine that if I were to walk around in the dirt, my shoes would get dirty. On the other hand, if we look at the work of Charles Goodwin, who studied uh, uh, archaeologists in the field, when an archaeologist looks at the dirt, they think about whether there's a post hole there. Um, and of course, uh, the way that they do that is actually by collecting bits of soil and then comparing them to something called a, uh, on a color chart. And they look for subtle variations in the color of the soil, which indicates that something might have, a post hole, a post might have rotted in place. They can figure out what was in the soil based on the variations in its color. In other words, they see a connection between soil, this thing called the Munsell color chart, and in this case, the post hole. 
Um, Goodwin's point is that all of these things function as cultural codes. And I'm using the big C code to go along with big C discourse here. Um, in other words, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Whoops, skip. Hello, let's go back. There we go. No, that's forward. That's back. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, so these big C codes are the things that somebody sees in the world when they are enculturated. They're this, the way that somebody makes sense of the world. And part of what a game does, or a learning environment does, or learning to be an archaeologist does, is teaches you to see the world in a particular way. Uh, but there's something about these codes that we need to uh, point out, which is that the codes don't just exist in isolation. Right? There's a relationship between soil and the Munsell color chart. You use the Munsell color chart to examine the soil, and you do that for a purpose. In this case, it's to determine that there is a post hole. In other words, an important part of, of enculturation is not just developing codes, it's understanding the relationship between those codes. It, uh, something that I call an epistemic frame. And you can think of an epistemic frame like a pair of glasses that you put on that helps you see the world in a particular way. And you see the world partly by understanding what the codes are, but also, importantly, by understanding the relationships between the codes, the things that connect those up. In other words, if a culture, if learning a culture means acquiring a discourse, acquiring a discourse means understanding the codes of that discourse, and importantly, it means understanding uh, the way in which those codes are connected to one another. Okay, so let me now kind of move from that theoretical piece to talking. To, to let me make that a little concrete in terms of the work that I do. So the thing that I build that, that I build and study are called virtual internships. So these are computer games uh, that are essentially elaborate role-playing games where students have a chance to work as engineers or architects or urban planners. Uh, uh, people who study political community, who work on political communications. Um, these are high-end simulations um, and with the idea that by participating in this simulation of real-world problem solving, the way as if, you, as if you were an intern at a company, you learn to acquire ways of thinking about the world that are socially meaningful. And along the way, of course, you also understand something about the underlying basic mathematics and, uh, langu and language skills and other things that are going to be useful in school, but probably even more important motivates you to see that you have a possible self, some future that you could, uh, some future self where you could actually be an architect or an engineer or an urban planner. Or you might see that you don't want to be those things and that's a good thing to learn too. Um, so in this particular uh, virtual internship rescue shell, uh, students are uh, designing a robotic exoskeleton for rescue workers. So the idea is if you're a rescue worker and you're going to pull people out of rubble, you need to have a uh, uh, the, uh, the robotic limbs help you carry heavier things, um, help you move faster, uh, uh, help you climb higher, those, all those sorts of things. Um, and just to give you a sense of context, this is, so students would participate in this for like 15 hours or so of gameplay. Um, as part of this, they work in teams, and their teams actually have dedicated, uh, essentially, uh, chat groups for them to uh, communicate in. And so, among other things, we get a record of their talk as they're working on design. And so they'll say things like, I'm wondering, did anyone have a prototype that was able to meet the internal consultant's recharge interval? Or is that something we might not be able to accomplish and focus more important characteristics such as, uh, to the workers, such as payload and agility? So once again, right, just as uh, Charles Goodwin's anthropologists are looking for soil and Munsell color charts and post holes, uh, our virtual engineers are looking for things like performance metrics the recharge interval and payload and agility of the device that they're manufacturing. And they're considering design trade-offs. Something you might not be able to accomplish and focus on more is more important than the characteristics of the workers. Um, now, the reason that it's important to think about this concrete example is that this is what we are trying to understand. Right? This process by which somebody becomes enculturated by acquiring a discourse, which means acquiring the codes and the connection between those codes. What we have, though, is this little D discourse. We have the stuff that happens in the world, the things that people say, the things that people do. And those things are pretty messy. There's a lot of it. Uh, it's not often, very, it's often not very well structured. It comes in many different forms. And even worse, we don't actually have all of the discourse. We don't have everything they said and did. What we have is some subset of that. We have field notes. Um, you can think of field notes in, in this case as being something like a log file, a record of all the clicks that they made and the things that they said in chat and the web pages they visited and on so on and so on. 
And this is organized, it can be organized typically into lines. If it's a click file, it's easy. There's usually the computer writes out one line every time something happens. Those of you who have worked ethnographically and taken field notes know that you actually wind up writing your field notes in lines. You start writing something, you stop writing something, you start writing something else. Um, of course, those lines have a certain structure to them. Um, in particular, uh, some lines are grouped together, the things that people said on one particular day during one particular activity. Um, those are called stanzas. Uh, again, actually borrowing from some of Jim G's work, but uh, things that are going to be related to one another. So we have field notes, and they have we can put some structure on them. The problem is we can't really go directly from field notes to culture. We can't really go directly from field notes to discourse, and we can't really even go directly from field notes to the codes without doing something else. We need what, Charles, what Andrew Pickering called a machinic grip. I actually personally prefer the term mechanical grip, mostly because mechanical is an English word and machinic isn't. Um, <laughs> but in any case, the idea of a mechanical grip um, is that it's the, it's, the scientific, it's the technology of science. It's the thing that lets us take these ineffable, um, uh, complicated, ill-defined things in the real world and kind of attach the tools of scientific inquiry to them. And in ethnography, and in particular in quantitative ethnography, the mechanical grip is this. We have big C codes, which are the culturally relevant and meaningful aspects of a big D discourse. They're the things that you care about if you're an archaeologist or an anthropologist or an engineer or an urban planner or a gamer. But we also have small C codes, which are things within this, the discourse, within the actual activity, that we're going to count as evidence or warrants for big C codes. In other words, we have a code book. Now, there's nothing particularly magical about this, but the idea is we identify particular categories that are important, big C codes in the data, and then we provide a definition of what those mean and examples of the kinds of things that we're going to take as evidence for those codes. Put another way, the, little C, the bridge between the little C codes and the big C codes is the way that we get from the stuff in the world to the actual understanding of what it, how it is that people are thinking um, it, inside their head. And this is the basic process of ethnography, something called thick description. And the idea is that we gather data and we construct an explanation such that we can go all the way from the little d discourse, the things that people say and do, to an understanding of how their culture works. One of the critical uh, challenges in ethnography, of course, is whether or not your description is thick enough. The term that people uh, typically use is theoretical saturation. It's whether or not I've collected enough data to know that, in fact, the story that I'm telling is not just something I happen to see in one particular place in time, but that actually has some uh, larger coherence to it. Uh, so, it. so that means that at least one key step here is this one. It's this bridge between the data that we have. Uh, it's the connection between the little c codes and the big c codes. Um, so, typically the way this works, as many of you probably know, working in research, is you have data and you add codes to it. Right? And those codes are essentially uh, strings of zeros and ones. And there you, can use, you can actually use probabilistic codes, but we, and we can talk about that later if you'd like. But they're strings of zeros and ones. I say that this code was present here and present here and not present here and not present here, that the code either is there or is not. The post hole is either there or it's not. They're either talking about performance metrics or they're not, and so on. And that can be done by a person, can be done by a machine. Typically, no matter who does it, we actually would like to have more than one. Why? Well, we want to make sure that, in fact, those, we're not just, this isn't just what one person or one machine sees. We want there to be some correspondence between the two. And essentially, what we're, what we're saying when we look for that is that there's a ton of data that is going to be coded a very, very long string of data. And what we want to see is that these two raters are in some kind of agreement. Um, a person and a machine, two people, two people and a machine, you can, you can imagine all the possibilities. And the way that we do that, and what we're interested in, in a sense, is that there's some measure of reliability, we'll just call that S for the moment, um, and that measure of their agreement is greater than some threshold. There's, we say they should agree to this level, and we want to see that they are actually agreeing above that level. Uh, typically, at least in, in my field in learning science, is kappa. Cohen's kappa is, a, is something that people use. Uh, there's, there's a ton of statistics, Jackard's J, and 
uh, Krippendorf's Alpha, and which would be a great name for a band, by the way, um, and, and a whole bunch of other things, uh, F statistics, precision recall, and so on. Um, and uh, Kappa has a, a sort of well-accepted threshold, which is, depending on who you talk to, 0 0.6, 0 0.65, some people prefer 0 0.7. We use 0 0.65 because it's sort of in the middle. Um, and the question is, is in fact this level of agreement above this threshold for all this data? So the way that people do that is, since you, you don't want to have two people rate all the data, I mean you can, um, it takes a long time. So typically what people do is they create a test set. So the two people or a person in a machine code some of the data and then they check to see what the kappa is. And if the kappa for that test set is good, then they conclude that the kappa for the between the two is good, and then typically one person or the machine goes and codes the rest of the data. Um, we call this in my lab the common method. Here's why we call it the common method, because we went and actually looked at the Journal of Learning Sciences and the International Journal of Computer Supported Collaborative Learning. We're looking at some other journals too, but you'll, you'll see, we didn't have to look that, that far to see, that there were 44 articles using kappa. They computed a total of 141 kappa values, and the number of times that kappa was tested that is the number of times that somebody checked to see whether or not the fact that they got a kappa from this small sample meant that their agreement overall was good was zero. So think about it. This is sort of the equivalent of saying, I want to know whether or not Danes on the whole are taller than Americans. So I'm going to measure the height of all the Danes in this room, and I'm going to measure the height of all the Americans in this room. And if the Danes are in the room are two inches taller than the Americans in the room, I'm going to conclude that the Danes are taller overall. Which is pretty silly. But that's essentially what people do with Kappa. So we did a, a Monte Carlo study, an empirical test, to see whether or not this basic assumption, this common method, works. So we tried a whole bunch of frequencies of codes. So imagine that, uh, you, as you can imagine, if codes occur very often in the data, then you're likely to get a different result than if codes occur very infrequently. So we went all the way from 1 in 100 to 0 0.5. 0 0.5, by the way, would be almost an absurd code. It happens half the time. Wouldn't tell you very much about the discourse. Much below 0 0.01, 1 in 100, it's actually, you're, unless you have very sensitive measures, it's, it's actually hard to do anything with that code. So the, here's the frequency range. And we looked at test set lengths all the way from 20, which is probably shorter than most people use, up to 800, which is absurdly large. Nobody uses 800. If you're going to code 800, you almost want to just code the whole data set. Uh, so what we looked at was the, to, we looked to see the false positive rate. So we actually constructed a whole bunch of data sets, and then we took a sample, and we computed the kappa of the sample and compared it to the kappa of the data set as a whole. So we're looking to see what the false positive rate is. It's terrible. Right? So... If you have a frequency of 0.1, which is actually you know, pretty high, some, sort of somewhere in the middle for qualitative data, and you code 200 excerpts, you're gonna mistake, you would mistakenly conclude that, you're, that you had a good kappa 10% uh, of the time, 11% of the time, actually 12. You have to get all the way up to a frequency of 0.2, which is 1 in 5. Something has to occur 1 in 5 times in the data, which is sort of crazy in, in most qualitative analyses. Um, and you have to code 800 data sets, 800 excerpts, before you would get good agreement. Now fortunately, there's, there's a better way to approach this. Right? So we can imagine, let's imagine that what we did was took these parameters, so we'll actually, we can use, eight, we don't have to use 800, it just happened to be the number that was on the slide, but let's, let's pretend that we said um, 0.2 is the frequency with which the code occurs in the data. So we could actually create a data set that had a frequency of 0.2. We pretend we had two coders. We could make it very long, 10,000, 100,000 records where there's the frequency occurs with 0.2 and where the kappa is less than 0.65. In other words, we know this is a data set where the raters are in bad agreement. But now let's not just create one data set. Let's create a whole bunch of data sets that have that property. And now, after we've created, let's say, 500, 1,000, 10,000 data sets, huge data sets, all of which have the same frequency that the code occurs, where the kappa is no good, let's sample them. And we'll take a sample of whatever length we're testing, so 800 or 5 or 10 or 100. And now what we can do is treat each of these as if it's a test set and compute its kappa. And now we're going to get 
I'm sure Val's going to nod in a moment. We're going to get a distribution of kappas in these test sets. We'll find out what kappas look like when you construct sets that we know are no good, right? and we sample them. So now we have, essentially, right, uh, the kappa of sets where sets are less than 0.65, which is basically a distribution of kappa under the null hypothesis. What would kappa look like if, in fact, these sets were no good? So now all we have to do is find our observed kappa, and we can compute the percentage, the likelihood that this observed kappa, the one we saw, what's the likelihood we would see it if, in fact, our set had a bad kappa? That is, we can empirically determine an estimate of our type 1 error rate for generalizing from our test set. We call the statistic rho. And the, so what rho does is essentially it, it lets you test whether or not your coding is any good. Now, interestingly, most qualitative researchers go, oh my god, it's hard enough to get kappa. I mean, I have to, get, I have to do this other test too? But that's not the way to look at it. The right way to look at it is that rho tells you when you've coded enough. It tells you that you don't actually have to use a very big test set. You could actually use a small test set and be sure, statistically, that in fact your uh, conclusion, that is your rate of agreement, is good. Um, for those of you who, who uh, want to start using this, and I encourage all of you to do it, uh, we actually have an R package that we built that uh, does these calculations um, for you automatically with Kappa. And sometime, probably in the next couple months, we're going to release a more general package that will let you do it with any statistic that you want. Jackard's J. Um, but we've also built this uh, methodology into a tool called the encoder. And the encoder is designed to support the... Uh, creation, uh, the creation and validation of codes of qualitative data. So encoder lets you upload a data file, uh, define a code, provide a uh, description of the code, and then critically you can start giving uh, keywords or regular expressions, key phrases that you would look for in the data as evidence of the code. Essentially you're defining your small c code. Uh, <clears throat> then the system brings up uh, uh, parts of your data, that you buy, uh, the lines of your data, and lets you determine whether or not the code is present. So you, co you essentially code a bunch of stuff by hand. And then critically, you can test to see whether your agreement with the computer is what, what the kappa is, and also, of course, what the row is. Now, most of the time, you don't get it right the first time through. So then um, you can do a couple other things. You can actually invite another human to code but you can also resolve your differences with the computer. So for example, you can look at the things where you and the computer coded differently. You can see what words or phrases the computer was looking for and change them. Um, you can actually write new phrases if you need to. Or you can even decide the computer's right and I'm wrong and, and, and leave it at that. Um, importantly, the system also gives you something called a training kappa. And what that means is it's telling you what the kappa between all the things that you've coded so far and the current uh, coding rule is. Because it may turn out that if I add a, a keyword or a key phrase to fix one excerpt, it might actually make my kappa overall go down. And so you could imagine that I could pick something that makes sense for this local thing that I'm coding, but in fact creates confusion elsewhere in the data. So the training kappa tells you whether the thing that you the change you just made actually makes your code better overall or worse overall. Um, now there are a bunch of other tools out there. Uh, people use topic modeling, natural language processing, various kinds, latent semantic analysis. All of those automated coding tools do this. <coughs> they help you go from your field notes, from the data itself, to some set of codes. They identify whether or not um, uh, they extract certain uh, linguistic features from the data. What ENCODER does, though, is both of these things. Right? It both produces rules that will let you automatically code your data, but then it, val it lets you validate those. It makes sure that, in fact, the rules that you've come up with are coding for the thing that you actually care about. That is, they're linking the, big C the little C code with the big C code. Put another way, what encoder is doing is providing a warrant for theoretical saturation. Rho is telling you that you've coded enough or you've, uh, you've uh, uh, refined your codes enough that in fact you have a valid link between the things you're identifying in the data and the things that you care about in the discourse. 
Um, okay, so we've talked about this link, but we also have to talk about now how we validate the connections, because the connections are important too. Um, so again, if we just turn to rescue this example from Rescue Shell for a second, um, <clears throat> we might imagine that in when you are working on a design, doing engineering, you care about things like the performance requirements, what the machine is actually supposed to do, and the design trade-offs. You can't make it do everything, so you have to trade off against some things. We're going to make it work on this, but not as well on that. We're going to make it really good on this, but not as good on that. It turns out, though, that these things, that these, perhaps these things aren't directly linked. It might be that, for example, performance metrics, the way in which you actually measure the performance of the device, is an important connection between what the people who are asking, who are commissioning the device want, and the trade-offs that you have to make. So what we're going to be, what we're interested in looking at is the way these things are connected to one another. Well, in order to be able to connect things in this network sort of way, we have to be able to at least connect two things. Right? So sometimes things are going to be connected in the same turn of talk or the same action or activity. Right? So here we can see that the person who's talking, I think it's Jeff actually, uh, is talking both about performance metrics, the recharge interval and payload and agility, and also about design trade-offs. But sometimes, because people are in conversation or because activity unfolds over time, Something that somebody says or does at one point in time might actually be connected to things that happened earlier in the conversation or earlier in the activity. Um, so what we, what we can do is create what's called a moving stanza window, where for each line of talk, we look back some certain, or line of action, we look back some certain time or certain distance and see what was happening in the recent temporal context and make the connections between those things. So for example, in this case, these two ideas are connected. And then in the next turn of talk, a different, set of line, a different set of connections are made. The idea then is that the data becomes now not just a set of codes, but actually a set of connections, where each line is associated with the things it's connected to. And what that means is we can now think about the uh, activity as an accumulating network of connections over time. So for example, there might be a connection made here, and then as the, and the next time, in the next turn of talk, a connection might be made here. Those would accumulate. And over time, we would see that some connections got thicker. Oops, yeah. Some connections got thicker. Some connections remained small. Some things might not be connected at all. So now we can actually compare the structure of connections. So for example, this might be one team working in the, uh, on the design problem. This might be another team working on the design problem. And now we can compare and see whether or not the teams have different networks, whether, the, whether their structures overlap, how they're related to one another. This sort of works OK for comparing, too. But if we want to compare more, we need some other mathematical representation of these networks. So one thing that we can do is for each network, we can associate the network with what I'll call a center of mass. So imagine that this is actually a physical object. That point represents the place where that object would balance. So for example, the center of mass of this blue network is over to the right because the connections are heavy on the right. The center of mass of this red network is over on the left because the connections are heavier on the left. And so now we can compare those networks not just by looking and trying to sort of look connection by connection at where they're different. We can actually compare them overall by comparing their centers of mass. And this is useful because now we actually can construct a metric space, a way of measuring across multiple networks and comparing them. Um, the way that we do that actually is that we, uh, the net, these networks are actually co-occurrence matrices. That is the way we count up the ways in which there are connections between the different codes in the data. Um, and we do a dimensional reduction. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to talk about the math of that later, but it's, the details of it probably aren't important right now. Um, so we take a high dimensional representation of these networks and we project it into a space. And then we optimize the location of the nodes so that we have this correspondence between the positioning of the nodes and the positioning of the points. And that means that now we can interpret these different patterns in terms of the relative uh, connections that are being made. So the red point, for example, is making co connections between data and collaboration and performance requirements. The blue is making connections between performance metrics, design trade-offs, and performance requirements. And notice, by the way, that that was sort of what our hypothesis was. 
that there was going to be a relationship between performance metrics and requirements and performance metrics and design trade-offs, and that was going to be mediating this connection. <clears throat> now, the, the way that uh, we do this is by using a, a technique called epistemic network analysis, and we've happily built a tool for that as well that's available online. Um, ENA lets you upload and, uh, files to a, a project. You can uh, tell the system how the, the data is organized within the file, so sort of who's talking to whom or what's, which stuff is related. How you want to analyze the data, so who are the going to be the, what are the units of analysis. What are the codes that you care about in the data. You can define these stanza windows. And then when you run the model, it looks something like this. So this is actually the mean network, the average network, for a group of relative experts doing this design task. Um, the, uh, the data points, so the, the uh, well, I'll, let me just zoom in, I'll show you. Okay. So that <laughs> is the location of the, the mean network that you were just looking at. These are all the data points from the individual groups uh, actually, no, those are the individual uh, participants. So these are the individual people who are relative experts that are, get, that are creating the mean. Um, that's what the mean network looks like. Um, and if we compare this, expert, this mean network of experts to the mean network of novices, which are in red, what we can see is that the experts have bigger connections between performance metrics, design trade-offs, and performance requirements. In other words, the same thing that we were looking at before, but now shown with real data analyzed in the ENA tool. Um, there, are some, there are some other nice features, of course, which is that we can go from those networks to looking at the, individual, the individuals. And so these are now, this is now looking at the individual network of thinking about engineering for each of the, for each of the participants. So we could, for example, construct a measure of expertise based on this. Um, but again, these points are now interpretable in terms of what it was that people were talking about uh, while they were playing. Um, we can construct statistical analyses. So in this case, not surprisingly, the two, the experts and the novices are statistically different. Um, we can create a goodness of fit measure so we can see how well our model actually fits the data. And of course, we can download the whole thing so that you could do more sophisticated analyses like structural equation modeling um, using the same data. The point here is that if that if encoder uh, connects field notes and codes, what ENA does is actually models the networks by which those codes are connected, and because it provide and um, provides us with uh, a measure, a p-value that lets us compare these networks and see whether they are statistically significantly different. In other words, it's also a warrant for theoretical saturation. This time, not about the codes themselves, but about the connections between the codes. There's another important thing, though, that ENA does. So for each of these models, we can click on it and, as we saw, pull up the, the networks. So we can actually compare these networks not just by looking at their summary statistics and saying these are statistically different. We can actually see the networks themselves. And in fact, if we click on any one of the lines in the network, we can actually go back to the data and we can see the different moving stanzas, the different sections in the data where, in fact, those codes are co-occurring, where that connection is being made. We can go back and read and see exactly what it was that people were saying and all the places they were saying it that leads to this network. Um, in other words, what ENA is doing is compatible with thick description. I can construct this very high level representation where I'm comparing the structures of networks in this network space. But I can go all the way back down through the networks that produce that, all the way down to the actual things that people were saying and doing to ground the claim that I'm making back in the original data. Um, in other words, what's happening is the, the uh, connections that ENCODER and ENA are making are kind of parallel to thick description. If we don't do that, if we just leave out a thick description, we get a thin description. We just get this very high-level quantitative uh, measure of things. Now, um, <clears throat> my mother told me that if I don't have anything nice to say, I probably shouldn't say anything at all. So I don't really want to bash thin description. But um, if you leave out this ability to go back to the data, if you lose this connection, it creates some real problems. Um, partly it creates problems because of something called Cohen's D or effect size, which Andreas was referring to earlier. Effect size is essentially a measure of how much of an effect something has. 
Here's why that's a problem. If I have tons of data, right? So this is, I'm, I'm not going to tell you what study this is from because I don't want to be bashing anybody, but this is a sort of typical study in learning analytics where you have, you know, 21 million data points from students playing some online game and there are 540,000 possible moves that they could make in the game and I'm going to take P of 0.001, a really nice conservative P value. Okay, but that means I'm likely to find 540 moves as being significant just by chance. And worse, my, my effect size is likely to be 0.001, which means that I'm going to be explaining something like, well, what is that? 25,000? No, 25. <laughs> it's very small, right? <laughs> I'm finding something very small because I have tons of data, right? And so I'm going to find something that's really, really tiny. Worse, still, when I find that, often it's not really interpretable as to what it would mean. So, for example, this is, a, this is actually from a, a study. This is people looking at PISA data, right? So tons and tons of data where they have all kinds of demographics about students across the world, and, those, they're math, and this was in math. And the study concluded that students who are socially and economically less advantaged have high anxiety towards mathematics and a low self-confidence in math, self-concept in mathematics, but still clearly above average attitude towards school are girls who perform below level three. Now, I'm not even sure what that means. I've read this many times. I'm not actually sure what it means. And to the extent that I am sure what it means, I don't know what I would do with it, right? Because it's not grounded. Right? And th this is, of course, the problem of, of garbage in, garbage out. What we want is to, is to have theoretical saturation, not just from our statistics, but be able to actually warrant that back to the original data. And what quantitative ethnography is doing is providing not just statistical warrants, it's providing statistical warrants that support the original, that support a grounded understanding of the data. Or as Clifford Geertz, one of the most famous ethnographers of the last century, said, the essential task of ethnography is not to codify abstract regularities, but to make thick description possible. Not to generalize across cases, but to generalize within them. And what quantitative ethnography is, is the science of using statistical methods to warrant claims about theoretical saturation in qualitative data. It's using statistics to tell you that you have either, either have enough data or have done enough analysis such that the thing that you're seeing in the data is a property of the data that you've collected. It's not necessarily for generalizing to large populations outside of data. That's not what ethnography is for. But it's good at, at generalizing within your data, saying that in a sense you have enough information to, um, to validly draw the conclusions that you're interested in in the data that you have. Um, so I'm going to uh, stop there. There's a bunch of people who have contributed to this. Uh, they're all on our website and other places in the National Science Foundation in the United States. Um, has been extremely helpful as well. Uh, the tools that I've talked about are all available for free online. Uh, you can find them at epistemicnetwork.org, or if you can't find them, then you can uh, send us email, and there's a very helpful graduate student who will show you where the tools are and can help you use them with your data, uh, talk with you about what you would have to do with your data to use them, and so on. Um, so I, I've completely lost track of time, um, but I trust that was less than an hour. Um, <laughs> Uh, but so let me stop. And do, uh, Andreas, do you want us to take questions after each after each talk? Yeah. Okay. So fire away. Yeah. Hi. Um, thanks a lot. That was really interesting. I just have to say that I lost the track a bit in the middle because it was really new for me. So I got the stuff with the kappa, which is interrater uh, reliability, mm -hmm. and that was really useful. For me. But I didn't really uh, get how I would get the data for the ENA. So. I, so I understand that then you compare the small codes to the big codes or small code system to other small code systems mm -hmm. probably, but how do, you how do you get that out of the field notes? I didn't get that. Right, step. so um, um, just thinking about what the best way to do this is. Uh, let me just go, go back to that slide or slides, a couple slides there. So the idea of, the idea of, um, ethnography is not, not just that uh, of epistemic frames and of um, ENA is that what it means to understand something is not just to understand individual pieces, right? I don't understand um, math because I understand what an integer is and I understand what a whole number is and I understand what a fraction is. It's because I understand something about the relationships between them. Okay. So that's what, we, that's what we would like to measure. 
So somehow we have to understand, we have, we have to see in the data how people are making connections between things. Now sometimes that they give it to that, they give it to us for free. They say or do something where we can see that they're making a connection. So here somebody's making a connection between these two codes, right in one thing that they say. That's easy. Right? But typically people don't just do do or say one thing completely in isolation. They do something within a context. So in this case, right, we're in a conversation. You said something, I said something in return, then you said something. Or even just in my talk, I had one slide and then another slide and then another slide. If the slides all were completely unrelated to another, one another, my talk would have been even more confusing than it already was. But the slides are related to one another. But they're not related to one another infinitely. I mean, in the talk, they sort of are, but, right? Um, right? The, the thing that I said now is going to be connected to something that I said a few, minute, a, a few turns of talk ago, a few minutes ago. So what we want to do is, is look at each thing that somebody says or does and look at what's called the, the recent temporal context. And so we're just going to look and see what codes are present in that recent temporal context. And we're going to assert that this thing, that this code here, is connected to whatever codes happen to appear recently just before it. And we're just going to take that window and slide it along the data. And this is done by each rater again. Well, so the way that this, so mechanically the way that this works is these are actually two separate processes. So typically you, you code the data. Yeah. And you can, however, you, you can code the data any way you want. You could code it entirely by hand. You could use encoder. You could use topic model. You could use whatever you want. ENA takes the coded data. And then essentially what it's doing is looking at the codes that have been provided to it. So okay. they're, they're two separate processes. It, it, what, it's, what it's doing is modeling the structure of the connections. And so literally what happens is each line is associated with a small network. That network is actually represented as a, as a co-occurrence matrix. So imagine all the codes on one side and all the codes on another, and we just mark a one where if the codes are co-occurring within that one, if this line makes a connection. So <coughs> this, ma this matrix would have it would say consultant justification attribute data, consultant attribute data, and then design-based justification, that would have zeros because that's not connected in this network. Each of, those, each, the, each of those matrices now, so each line is represented by a matrix. So now if I want to know your, the connections you've made, I just sum up the matrices for all the lines that you're associated with. That gives me your matrix. Right. The nice thing about it is it gives me your matrix in the context of the discussion. So I see the way you've made connections to things that other people have said. But I'm actually able to extract just the things you've contributed. So this, is an, this actually lets us measure an individual's participation in the collaborative process. Okay. So then, then when we sum those up, that gets a, that's a, the, your cumulative network over the span of whatever we're measuring of the connections that you're making. And then you could compare that either to one other participant or you could make groups, and that's what you did, right? The exactly. Okay, thanks. <laughs> right. So essentially, it's, it's a way of constructing, uh, construct, so if, all science has to have some object of study, right? And so what ENA is doing is making it possible to have, have the connections that somebody's making between the codes that matter within the discourse be the object of study. And if you could, of course, it doesn't have to be a person. I could model the connections that the whole group made and look at those and compare groups. I, mean, um, I don't even have to compare. I could just look at what one person did using the tool. That's not typically how people use it. Yeah, and then just a quick follow-up on that one. Um, does it? What effect does the size of that Spanza window have on, on that part of the analysis? Yeah, it has the same sort of effect that turning the the focal length of a microscope does. So certain things, so it, you can, so um, just do a thought experiment, right? If I made the stanza window infinite, I counted everything that everyone said all at once, essentially I'd get a completely flat network, right? And all I would see is that everything's connected to everything else, right? So everybody's network will look the same. And, and on the other hand, if I zoomed it all the way down, and let's say I went below the level of the line, right? I actually looked at words, individual words. Well, then nothing would be connected to anything else, and I would get a completely equivalent network where everything was flat. And so there, there are sort of two ways of thinking about how big you want to make that window. One of them is um, 
uh, uh, sort of an empirical approach, which is to say, well, how far back actually are people making reference? Well, what is that? What's sort of the, the didactic length, if you if you will? How far back, in fact, are people referring without calling things back into the common ground? Right. So what happens in a conversation is if if somebody brings up something that is going to be that I said at the talk about at the beginning of the talk, they'll actually repeat it. They'll reintroduce it into the common ground. So I don't have to worry about uh, having the window be that long. And then you can you, you can compute that, right? You just take a subsample of data and you figure out what is the what's the average referent length. It would be better to be able to actually figure out what the referent is, but that's a problem in natural language processing that no one solved yet. Um, the other way to think about it is just sort of with the fo as, from the focal length point of view. What features are, do you see as you adjust the length? Right? So you're gonna, it's going to let you see certain kinds of patterns and, and not others. So there's sort of two approaches. To take. And so that's a great question and obviously one of the critical decision points. That, I mean, there's lots of decision points you're making. Which codes do I use? How many of them do I include? What size should the window be? What groups do I compare? The nice thing here is that, is that those decisions can and should all be grounded in the data, right? So you, what you want is somebody to read the data and say, okay, here's what I think is happening. Now what codes am I going to use to describe that? Now what sort of model is it that I'm going to construct that's going to reveal that? Rather than just, I mean, you can, but it's, I don't think it makes much sense to simply say, well, I'm going to use late semantic analysis to figure out what clusters of words hang together. I'm going to find five clusters of words and then I'm going to throw them into the model, and then I'm going to... Uh, now, pe people have done... They, we, we've used DNA that way, trust me. I mean, you can do it on MOOCs, for example, right? So everybody likes MOOCs, so you, know, you can do it on a MOOC. Um, and, you know, you'll, you can find some patterns. But then you actually have to go back and say, okay, now what's really going on? And that's where that the sort of feature of DNA that you can actually look at what's driving the networks is really useful. You had a question. Extremely close to a related question, maybe even the same one. It was, um, can that window length be a free parameter in any model, so you can see what the effective history is? Um, well, so you can, do you, mean, do you mean something you can actually change on the fly? Yeah, so you can say, you yeah. can estimate what the optimal focus would be for getting the network of connections that you get at the end. Well, um, so more empirical. yeah, yeah, sure, I understand. Um, uh, so for those of you who didn't follow that, that little bit of, of um, shorthand in code, right? Um, <laughs> Is there some way to, rather than specifying what the length is up front, to actually um, specify some characteristic of the output that you would like, some network structure or difference between the groups, for example, and then run the model repeatedly with different, uh, effectively, run the model repeatedly with different window sizes, right, and see which one produces the, uh, the most discrimination, let's say, between experts and novices? Um, no, we haven't done that. There isn't any particular reason why you couldn't. Uh, the, ENA, the way ENA works is that, there, that the, what you were seeing is a front end to a set of R, pack, uh, essentially an R package. We haven't packaged it up yet. But, um, <coughs> and so what, students, what my students routinely will do is uh, do some of the processing in, uh, on the web tool, then download the data, rework it, and then put it back up for visualization. So yeah, that would, would not be... That would be relatively easy to do if you knew how to program in R. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, there might be some way to do it. I would just do it, in, I would just do it empirically, brute force. Because right? there aren't that many window sizes, right? You're not going to be running, no. you're talking about running 10 models or something, right? Yeah. It's much beyond 10 and you're, you know, you're, it's a, that's a, yeah, it's a big, it's a big window size. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. So really, really interesting. <clears throat> and of course, it works beautifully when, so to say, the, the nature of the data are already text coded. But a lot of ethnographers would say, you know, that the whole process of making your field notes is really where the trick is. And in a sense, this could move the focus away from that process of interpretation and getting back again to the field site, etc., and into a stage where the data are, so to say, already coded. And this, you could say, would also in a very particular understanding of what ethnography is about. Mm -hmm. Do you have a stance on that? I do, um, and my stance actually is is that uh, I, I don't see this as as being incompatible with what what let's just call sort of classical ethnography, like you know a person in the field. I I I actually force all the students who. Uh, 
work in my lab to do an actual ethnographic study, and, I, and when I teach quantitative ethnography, I actually have students go into the field and understand the construction of field notes so that they don't just assume that, because of course, the, this stuff that is spit out by the <coughs> log file of the game is no, is no more essential than the notes that somebody takes as an ethnographer. They're, they're both constructed things, they're both selective and so forth. Um, so uh, I think, uh, I, I think the, the way to look at this is that um, this is a, a tool in the ethnographer's toolkit. Right? There's nothing that is, there's nothing that is um, uh, in any way uh, better about having uh, done uh, iterator reliability on your codes than the uh, more traditional ethnographic approach, which is to have one person code them because it's my interpretation, I'm telling you the story of my interpretation. It is better to, you, to actually do statistical testing. If you're going to do iterator reliability, you should do it right. But that doesn't mean that you have to do it. Similarly, the story that an ethnographer, uh, the report that an ethnographer makes is not somehow better because they've used DNA. But DNA would be another tool that somebody could use in order to visualize their story, in order to, in order to uh, uh, see what's, what they think might be happening in the data better. Um, so it, the, the, there, there's, there's nothing that is, um, in fact, quite explicitly the opposite. This is not trying to say that we should be supplanting the kinds of data collection, the kinds of data analysis that produces thick description. This is a way of, of thinking about the organization of the data that goes into a thick description such that you could make generalization within the sample possible. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. But again, if, if we go back to Gerd, so let's mm -hmm. take his classical instance of the crop fight, right? Mm -hmm. Which is the description of the field. Uh, we we read it every year in my class, yes. He has <laughs> uh, no idea of what goes on in the field and he watches this cockfight and suddenly police comes and everybody runs away and because they shared this experience together, his way of being in the field is radically transformed. Absolutely. So it's kind and of, you know, a one-off event yep. that in a way, how would you deal with something like this in an ENA framework or would you say, well, you know, in the ENA framework is good for other things? Than, for instance, understanding no, no. I, so, so the so are people familiar with the cockbite? Okay. So, first of all, if you take one thing away from this boot camp, go read Clifford Geertz's notes on a Balinese cockfight. It's fabulous. First of all, it's just really well written, and he's writing about cockfighting for heaven's sake. So, um, <laughs> it's really good. Uh, and so the story uh, I don't know your name, but Andreas. That Andreas. Oh, the, the story that Andreas was just telling is that the the this ethnography kind of unfolds in two parts. Well, the first part is the story of how he shows up in this village and literally no one will pay attention to him. They treat him like he's invisible. And then there's a cockfight going on in the village and the, there's a raid and he runs away with everybody. Instead of just saying, oh, I'm a foreigner and like showing his papers, he runs away with everyone else and like hides in the chief's house and that makes him an insider. Now everybody will, everybody's, you know, his friend and, they, and, and he's able to do his ethnography. And as a result, he becomes interested in the cockfight and so on and so on. Um, so I think the place where ENA, the, the place where ENA would, would acquire its mechanical grip is when in that story, Geert starts actually going to the cockfights and telling the story and telling the story of the significance of the cockfights. And not to spoil this for you, it turns out that there's two kinds of bets that are made on the cockfight. One of them is the actual bet by the people who own the, the chickens that are fighting. And then the other is the bet that all the spectators are making. And there's a relationship between those, and it's very complicated, and it's tied with status and the village and a whole bunch of other things. So all of those ideas about these things being connected, that's where ENA could, would, get its, would, would, would get its purchase. So presumably, Geertz's field notes would say that, you know, this co these cocks were fighting, these were the people, this was the status relationship, and it could actually ex sort of model that information. And ironically, the reason that I use the cockfight in my quantitative ethnography class is that a su significant part of Geertz's argument is actually quantitative. It's about the size of these bets and the way in which those are related to one another. Uh, and he's essentially making a statistical claim, although he doesn't use statistics to do it, that this wrote that there's a correlation between them. Right? So this would, be a, this would be a way of essentially taking what Geertz is already doing, and he actually says at one point in a footnote, like, this, this should be left to somebody who does statistics better than I do to really explore this. Um, so this would be a way of, of picking up at that point in the story. It does, it, I don't think it would touch on the kind of methodological piece that Geertz has at the beginning about uh, 
uh, gaining informants and, and, uh, and becoming connected in, in your site. But once he started actually, once he had decided that he was going to collect data about the cockfight, um, then that's where I think it would get its purchase. Is that helpful? Yeah. Yeah, on, uh, this Andreas, and then I don't know, <laughs> I don't know your name. But. It's just a really practical question tied into ENA and, and that uh, quantitative side of ethnography. So say you have uh, play observations. You have kids uh, taking turns doing things. Not a lot of stuff being said. It's, it's being done. Yep. And what you can often do is you can count you know, the, the size of, uh, the, the span of movements or how many times they'll do something or, or whatever. I mean, mm -hmm. there, there are many different things you can do. So all of a sudden you have um, quantitative variables that are continuous. Mm -hmm. I'm not guessing that they you know, would handle something like that so well. So you'd have to instead say like shorts, burst, long burst, <coughs> medium burst, or, or how, how would you? Uh, no, so ENA actually can handle continuous data. Um, uh, okay. So for example, you could have a probability assertion. So one easy way to think about it is you could have probability assertions about a code. I'm 50% certain that this code is here, so I'm going to give this a 0.5. And essentially, essentially all it's doing when it's making the, when it's, it is that it's, con when it constructs the, so this is a matrix, right? This matrix has one, all ones and zeros, but you could have a matrix that had numbers of, you could have fractional numbers, you could have uh, numbers that were, you know, tens and hundreds or whatever. Uh, you do have to think a little bit about the comparability of your numbers, right? So 10, a span of 10, 10 minutes and 15 Lego bricks don't necessarily multiply together to get 150 Lego minute bricks, right? That's not necessarily a, a, a sensible metric. Um, so there's, you, have to, you have to be a little bit careful when you do it, but no, that, that doesn't have a problem with that. The, the thing, though, that you, that, you, that you do have to think about is you can't just count stuff, right? You actually have to say that this thing that I've counted is meaningful, that it, it's a big C code. It has some significance. Then how you, how you uh, uh, account for that, how you find that, that, that marker of significance in the data, you can, you can count things, you can do anything you want. Your little C code can be anything you want, but you have to have a big C code. And so to say that there's a certain span, you're actually saying the span length is important. And what happens is typically once you make that move, then you typically do start thresholding things. You don't have to. But typically then you're saying, well, wait, a short span means this and a long span means that. It's not really true that like a span of six is twice as good as a span of three. It's typically that they were in, you know, this is a brief engagement and this is a sustained engagement, in which case then you are dichotomizing. You don't, again, you don't have to. But it, it, it's important that, that the things that you're coding for are meaningful, not just that they are available. And, it's in, and that move is the... Is the the thing that one of the things that trans that makes this ethnographic and not just uh, quantitative analysis. You have a question. Uh, so um, you have actually applied uh, these methods to Garrett's descriptions. No, I wish I had Garrett's field notes. That would be a hoot. But no, I have not. Um, but I have had. I, we have applied them then to ethnographic field notes that people take by hand. I have students who do it. Uh, people have worked with uh, inter, you know. Um, semi-structured interview data. We've also used a whole bunch of other crazy things like eye gaze data, right? Because what you saccade to, what you focus on, is also a measure of meaning. Um, Do you have any publications on those? Uh, yes. Gaze? Yep, the eye gaze, there is, a public, there is at least one publication. Somebody's just finishing their thesis uh, on, it's essentially trying to get uh, robots to track, to do eye gaze tracking uh, appropriately in coordinated tasks. So they looked at, they looked at the, Gaze coordination between somebody making a sandwich and somebody ordering the sandwich. Anyway, but it's on it's on the it's on the web page. I don't know the website isn't up there, but uh, I in a break I can show you it. Um, other questions? Oh, thank Super. you so much. Thank no, thank you. So